Our first Hidden Gems episode gave us a chance to talk about a few games that otherwise we might not have had a chance to talk about. In that episode, we each picked a sort of loose theme. I showed off some overhead shooters, while Tri looked at a couple of generally disliked games that have really good alternate versions. The themes helped us focus while challenging us at the same time. So, hey, let's give it another shot. Let's check out some more games that we'd consider hidden gems. The Time Crisis series showcase that Corey did inspired me to get a Gun Con 2 and some PS2 light gun games along with it, including a few that I had no idea even existed. Let's take a look at a couple of on-rail shooters for the PS2. The battle among humans has ceased, and in its place, a new battle has begun. Humans against demons. Ninjas with guns fighting demon robots? You're right, I didn't see that coming. Want to make an on-rails ninja-themed action game? Swords and shurikens too fiddly? The solution is easy. Just give your ninjas automatic pistols. Ninja Assault was released by Namco on the PS2 in 2002, having been previously released as an arcade game in 2000. Ninjas Gurin and Gunjo set out with their trusty firearms to save Princess Koto from becoming a sacrifice to the resurrection of the demon shogun Kigai. The home release sees the addition of a third ninja, Aoi. It's pretty much the most basic plot ever and whether intentional or not, it really nails the tone of classic martial arts English dubs. Are you the fools who dare to challenge hell? We are the Dragon Lords. We slay all who intrude upon these grounds. This place will be your tomb! You choose one of four paths. Gurun, Aoi, Gunjo, and Arcade. Cutscenes play out a bit differently in each, and they feature different assortments of levels, a few of which are exclusive to the home version. This helps keep the game from getting too repetitive as you practice and earn extra credits. The action is pretty standard on rails fare. Shoot enemies, shoot down projectiles, and that's pretty much it. You do have a limited use full screen crash type attack, which is absent from the arcade mode. There's little meaningful difference between characters, but Aoi's gun does hold considerably more bullets. From a gameplay perspective, it's absolutely nothing unique at all, but if you enjoy stuff like House of the Dead, well, it's not exactly a booming genre, so any good option is welcome. If anything, it's the ninja theme that sets it apart. The game moves fast and it's fun having the on-rails perspective jump around and run along rooftops. The character paths are all six levels long. Arcade mode features nine stages, so it's quite a bit tougher to get through. There are also a few mini games and a mission mode. I had a fun time playing through Ninja Assault, and while it's not terribly original, it is a good effort in underserved genre. It's easy to find for under 10 bucks, so if you're into light gun games, it's a good grab. Now, Ninja Assault does not support the Gun Con 1, only Gun Con 2. So since I only have one of each, I never tried co-op. But a year earlier, Sega and Namco released another arcade port on the PS2 that supports both Gun Con 1 and Gun Con 2. Vampire Night. Two vampire hunters appear to take on the dark forces of 
Sir Vampire. Yes, it's just as campy as you'd hope a Sega light gun game might be. They're coming. Vampire Night was released to arcades in 2000 and ported to the PS2 in 2001. It's overall pretty simple. No special abilities, die if you take three hits. Arcade mode is just what you'd expect. Limited credits start over when you game over. You can choose how many credits you get in the options, but this home port offers a much more interesting way to play. Special mode begins with the vampire hunters receiving a mission each time you begin. If you complete the mission either now or on another attempt, you'll get special rewards. But before you get going, you can also check out the shop and equipment screen. Here you can spend silver that you earn in special mode for weapon upgrades, accessories, and very helpful consumable tools. And by very helpful, I mean stuff like extra hits per life, extra credits, and even warps that let you skip straight to later levels. Each player can equip one weapon upgrade, one accessory, and two tools, but tools disappear after each attempt. So if you're thinking about bringing the good stuff, you gotta be confident you're ready to make a strong go at it. You'll also find random tools hidden in destructible objects, which can be used in later runs or sold for silver. At first, we thought that buying a shotgun for each player would be the way to go, but ultimately we found that one of us with wide coverage and the other with higher precision ended up striking the best balance. Special mode is just a really fun way to blend the challenge of a quarter muncher with the customization and sense of progression that you'd expect from a home console game. I must admit, you have done well. Go. Humans? How vain can you be? Enough! You humans disgust me! Now it's your turn to suffer! Aside from simple shooting, a couple of small gameplay elements challenge your speed and accuracy. Throughout the levels, villagers appear with head crab or Las Plagas type things attached. If you successfully shoot the parasite without hurting the villager, they'll be saved. But if not, they'll transform into a monster. And when fighting bosses, a red stagger meter appears beneath their life bar. If you hit the weak point enough before time is up, you'll cancel their next attack. Vampire Knight just turned out to be a really fun shooter with a great PS2 version. And it's made all the more fun thanks to that turn of the century Sega cheese that you just gotta love. Even though these games do have controller modes, you're not going to get the full experience unless you've got a GunCon 2 and a compatible CRT television. If that sounds like a bit of a hassle, then maybe Corey's got something for you. The Xbox 360 has had some decent hidden gems during its extended lifetime. Maybe it was me just not paying nearly as much attention as I should have been but I found myself pretty amazed at some of the stuff I've stumbled across seemingly at random. Here's a couple of games whose existence were a pleasant surprise for me. I ride a very fine line between loving and hating the digital download era. For every little bit of convenience, you risk having a title being delisted forever. Even though I have a sizable digital library at this point, I took a stance that, when given an option, I'll go with the physical copy every chance I get even if I end up double or even triple dipping. Res HD is a high-definition remaster of Tetsuya Mizuguchi's magnum opus, Res, that was released on Xbox Live Arcade in 2008. Previously only available on the Dreamcast and PlayStation 2, this was one game that I wanted in a physical edition for a good number of years. Little did I know that it actually was released physically, along with two of Mizuguchi's other titles, E4 and Luminous Live, on a compilation disc called Cubed. So while Rez and the other two games might not be hidden gems themselves, this compilation disc certainly is. If 
you're unfamiliar with Res, then you are in for a real treat. It's a trippy musical rail shooter that takes you inside of a supercomputer whose AI has decided to commit suicide, or something like that. At least I think that's what's going on. You control this flying guy who is equipped with lock-on laser beam missiles, which function pretty much exactly like Panzer Dragoon. Lock on up to eight enemies at once and let loose. A side effect of this is that the sound effects create additional beats to the music, which builds throughout the level. Res is a game that you should really try to experience for yourself. Seriously, turn out the lights, crank up your stereo or headphones, and just get swept away. There's nothing really visually or orally quite like it, except for its spiritual successor, Child of Eden, which is a hidden gem in its own right. Anyways, what about the other games on this compilation? In E4, which stands for Every Extend Extra Extreme, you control this shape and make it explode on the beat of the music. What if you don't have a good sense of rhythm? Then just watch this meter down here. As you detonate the shape, it'll cause other shapes around it to blow up too, which leads to a chain reaction and raises your score to astronomical heights. Included with this game are some alternate modes, such as a twin stick shooter mode and the ability to play rips of your own music. Beyond that, it's a pretty simple game that I'm sure has quite a bit of nuance under the surface, but I haven't spent enough time with it to really discover it. Luminous Live is a lot like Tetris, but with a musical twist. Your main goal is to match at least four of the same colored blocks together, while this timeline moves to the beat of the music. As it passes by, it'll cause those matched blocks to disappear. It's a bit more complex than these type of games tend to be, but the music really helps you get into the zone. I know that Luminous has its fans, but it's been relegated mainly to portable systems, so if you wanted a version to play on your TV, then this one is definitely for you. All three of these games have a lot of unlockable content. The disc itself also has an interview with Tetsuya Mizuguchi as he tells us about each game during his, I assume, commute to work. The only real problem that I have with Cube as a whole is that it's literally impossible to return back to the game selection menu once you start a game. Since these are literally the Xbox Live Arcade games on a disc, selecting Return to Arcade just boots you back out to the dashboard. Luminous Live and E4 might not come close to the absolute magnificence of Res HD, but the overall style and musical experience of this compilation make it a real steal for the $15 to $20 that it tends to go for today. A small price to pay to have these games on a physical disc. Next, let's check out something a little bit more hardcore. Akai Katana, Shin. Akai Katana, a horizontally scrolling bullet hell shooter from Japanese developer Cave, was released in the US in 2012 by Rising Star Games. If you're unfamiliar with what a bullet hell shooter is, then this will sum it up pretty well. Okay, before I start, I need to make a point and state that I am nowhere near being any good at these kind of games. Veterans of the genre would probably look at this gameplay footage and wondering what the heck I'm doing. I just simply love playing them, and the complete exhilaration that comes along with pulling off some sweet moves keeps me coming back. Okay, so here's the hard part. Explaining what the heck is happening on screen at any given moment. This looks like complete chaos, right? Well, I'll give it a try. You choose three different characters across three different game modes. Each mode has its own set of rules. Origin is based on the arcade version of the game. Climax is like Origin mode, but removes some of the scoring limitations and increases the playing field. Finally, Slash mode evolves and changes the gameplay significantly, and is also the mode where I've spent most of my time with the game. In Origin and Climax mode, your main goal, besides racking up a huge score, is to collect these green energy orbs so it fills up this gauge up here. As it fills, hitting the summon button changes your plane into some sort of warrior god whose aura can reflect bullets and unleash high-powered attacks. 
As you stay in summon form, defeating enemies will cause these gold scoring items to orbit around your character and an increase in size and value the longer you keep them there. In slash mode, things get a bit more complex. Depending on your proximity of attack, you can collect these silver orbs called steel. These give you an alternate attack, which allows you to let loose up to 16 of these giant swords, which can then impale bullets and enemies and cause them to spew high point items. Look, I realize that this might make no sense to watch, but there is a handy in-game tutorial which breaks everything down for you. Even then, the only real way to get a feel for it is through multiple play sessions. I'm not afraid to admit that it took me a long time before I truly figured out what I was doing. One of the things I love most about Bullet Hells is that they're more intense than the Jimmy Chamberlain drum solo in 1996. This is hilarious, right? Because your hitbox, meaning the area of your character that has to be hit for you to die, is so small, sometimes you'll be able to pull off some crazy moves and survive the impossible. Everything in Akai Katana is drawn with detail and huge, but let's be honest with ourselves. You're barely gonna have a chance to admire these well-animated sprites. Bosses will throw all kinds of stuff at you. Battleships, planes, aircraft carriers, you name it. I'm sure all of this is explained in the story, but I prefer just to roll with the complete randomness of it. I have no idea what the developers were on when they concocted this stuff, but I love it. Only a select few of Cave's arcade ports that were released on the Xbox 360 in Japan ever made it west, but I'm pretty grateful to Rising Star Games for bringing Akai Katana over to the US because it is completely awesome. So if you're interested in dipping your toe into the bullet hell pool, at the time of the production of this episode, you can grab a brand new copy of Akai Katana for under 12 bucks. So at least you're not out too much if it doesn't quite click with you. So, PS2 light gun games and a couple of Xbox 360 titles that flew under the radar. And best of all, they're pretty affordable. We only picked two each, so maybe we missed a few of your own favorites. We're always on the lookout for cool overlooked games, so let us know.